Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for uh, for this invitation and for the <coughs> allowing me to speak to you. Um, I will give in this presentation a a uh, reflection on how to include social science into computational models. And I do this from my experience in the last 25 years in working in different uh, disciplines. And um, I'm trained as a mathematician, but work, uh, work mainly in the social science department. So I may make some statements, um, especially about social science that might be a little bit um, um, exaggerated. Uh, so, uh, but I, I want to make some points so it may help you to in a way put a little bit black and white sometimes. So the outline is that I give so, some background to, to this context, uh, this brief history about integrated models uh, of humans and the environment. Then a discussion of uh, some challenges in the social, uh, getting social science represented uh, in integrated models. And I provide two examples in which I have work with social scientists in modeling hunter gatherers and about water management in Mexico City. And I conclude, and um, I'm not familiar with your culture, but I hope to have some discussion. So far there has been only talks, so I hope we have some, some discussion too. So why do I have the title to modeling cultures? It refers to a famous essay by uh, C.K. Snow uh, entitled Two Cultures. And that essay is, is uh, from, uh, from about six years ago. It's referred to these distinct cultures between the humanities and the sciences. And he uh, argued that they were quite distinct um, uh, communities where were not really interacting with each other. So this essay got a lot of critique, uh, but um, um, uh, and I'm not arguing that we are all uh, that the natural and the social science are completely separate. But I think it's 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 useful to realize that if we want to interact with the social science, they may have quite different practices, and at least that's how I experienced it. And it might be good to to know um, uh, uh, before if you start want to work across these uh, different areas. For example, a lot of social scientists are not trained are not familiar with uh, quantitative methods or are um, uh, opposed to use any quantitative uh, or using mathematical tools to um, explore their, their scientific activities. And I will come to, to that. And, and there are good reasons for that. So, uh, so here I give, in a way, a perspective of two modeling cultures in the, as, as if they are in the social and natural sciences. So my background is in a way, but I, I rely on my background to, to make this thing because I uh, experience these cultures in, in, um, um, uh, in the hard way. So I hope that you may learn something of that. So uh, my training is in operation research. I, I worked uh, when I was doing my PhD in a, in a group on integrated stress modeling. Uh, and there was not much social science. That was more kind of the, the, the kind of the natural science uh, group, the, the image group, the well-known integrated assessment model. Uh, then I got more interested in the social science to start working more in economics, uh, environmental economics, and then in political and behavioral economics. And then I got a tenure track position in anthropology, in the Department of Anthropology, while I had never took, an, uh, t I never took a course in anthropology myself. Uh, so you can become a professor in anthropology without uh, having any preparation for that. But uh, the department was transforming to a school which was more interdisciplinary, and my hire was part of that. So I got the kind of uh, I got a culture shock there too. Um, I got tenure there and I came promoted to professor. But now I'm in the school of sustainability where we have no idea. It doesn't matter which background you have. So, um, but uh, by making, moving around these different disciplines, I've experienced that there are quite a lot of uh, differences in how people approach the use of mathematics. And uh, so I teach uh, typically uh, mathematics or, uh, to, 
uh, or computational methods to social scientists and to ecologists. And so that's the, uh, that leads to interesting discussion. So I give now a brief discussion of some uh, integrated uh, models. So uh, as I think some of you may, may know this, but gives a kind of a context of uh, where I come from. So in the early 70s was a uh, well-known um, study on limits to growth, uh, the Wall Tree model, uh, which is uh, a kind of a, a one of the, uh, the first integrated models of e uh, human and uh, and natural systems, although you may argue there's not really much natural systems. The social scientists will argue there's not much social, but it, this, uh, at least it was a, a first attempt to, to bridge the different components. Um, the, uh, this is a figure where uh, they also included data. Um, uh, let's see whether I can point to this. But the data which you see here are the actual data. So these are, so this is not from the study of 72. These are some results, uh, the reruns uh, done in recent years. And it shows that the, the kind of predictions, although there was not aimed to be a predictive model, but the, the doom scenario, we are still on track. Um, there, was, there were many different scenarios in that in that publication, including a stabilized uh, stabilization scenario, that scenario is not possible anymore uh, given the current uh, trajectory. So, um, so this model was, uh, was uh, not aimed for making uh, uh, predictions. They had a lot of different scenarios, but the doom scenario mainly stuck uh, among us. This study got a lot of critique and um, the main critique was that there were a lot of uh, assumptions that were really um, kind of expressing the subjective subjectivity of the models themselves. Um, one interesting paper by Bill Nordhaus, which we will see later uh, uh, too, was the, the measuring without data. Uh, Bill Nordhaus is an economist and he argued that there was no economics in this model. So that was, of course, an important Charles, there's another interesting book where they show that a lot of the results were uh, driven by the assumptions they made you. There are a lot of uncertainties and you can make choices in the assumptions and a lot of the outcomes were driven by the assumptions they made. Um, I, I think that Dennis Meadows and his colleagues, they knew a lot of these issues and they therefore explored a lot of different scenarios, but these kind of doom scenarios stick to, to the broader audience. Um, I think this model was very useful as an eye opener. It was not uh, aimed to be a kind of predictive, detailed human environmental systems model. Um, there have been a number of, of follow ups, which were more regionalized versions, uh, but the next major step in integrated modeling was uh, uh, the development of integrated assessment models. And uh, there are two different types of brands, as I see that. So this is uh, a picture of the image model, the, um, the group I was working in. So you see that the, on the left, the, the, the human component is basically input. The input is the economic development, the, the technology, um, uh, the assumption about technology and the demographics, that those are not um, uh, driven by the, the are not influenced by the environmental system. They are more or less exogenous inputs to the system that generates then emissions and uh, 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 are inputs to some uh, uh, integration of simplified versions of the earth system dynamics. So, and then the output is a climate change, which has some impact on land use change, but human component is very limited. So I got interested by working in this group. So why, are humans not represent? So that's why I got more interested in getting into the human component because they were not in that, in that uh, area of research. Um, there's also another type of integrated assessment modeling, uh, which is more coming from economics. Uh, here we see uh, uh, Bill Nordhaus again, who was complaining about the World Tree model. He had developed a very uh, well-known integrated assessment model that is used a lot. It has a uh, handful of equations 
and to describe um, all the relevant components um, uh, of the climate system and the economy. And uh, in a, the typical models in, in economics, they, they, they make the, they calculate the optimal policy for the next 200 years, uh, assuming that the representative agents have full understanding and full knowledge of the system and full control of the system. So, the, um, so there are very tight feedbacks between the actions and the impact. And uh, of course, a lot of these uh, underlying dynamics are highly simplified and highly aggregated. But the model has been very influential in, in, in policy. So these two types of integrated assessment models, which were uh, kind of starting in the 1990s, they, they in a way, uh, and I left the, this kind of field uh, in the late 90s, but I think there's still the same issues at the moment. And when I, we had this meeting a year ago, it was a kind of a deja vu from my dissertation work, because uh, 20 years uh, later, still the same debate between the, the kind of people working on the human components and on the natural science components. So can we capture the complexity of both the social and the environmental systems? So I think that's, that's uh, one of our, our aims. And I think there are a lot of reasons why there's still this divide. Um, uh, and I think also has a lot to do about, about the, the interaction between different disciplines. Um, but I, I tried to provide one, ex, I prof give one example of what I did in my dissertation as uh, tried to use some uh, at that time, when I did my dissertation, were new tools coming out of a complex adaptive system to represent agents who are able to learn and adapt. And so I combined elements of uh, the image model and the dice model. And uh, so I had the economics of the dice model and the climate uh, system of the image model. And I had agents who are, um, actually they had something that might be controversial today, they learned from facts. So uh, that is, uh, so that, that was a kind of crude assumption. And, uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's really good to, to do modeling if you don't know much about a particular field. But I assumed that, that, that agents will learn from facts. And, and so I could uh, explore different uh, situations. What if the climate system was sensitive to the emissions? It was a high climate sensitivity then the agents will experience the climate change more rapidly and they may, that may lead to a lower emission level. So a lower emission level goes here with a higher temperature change because they cannot adapt fast enough. Uh, but if the climate sensitivity is very low, uh, there is not much uh, reason to adapt and you will lead to high emission levels. So this is an example of a kind of a more uh, kind of integrated, more, uh, more, uh, the agents are reacting to the, to the environmental system. But we made up a lot on what we were doing because we didn't really uh, capture much, we didn't really understand much about the social side. So, but I, I got interested in these agent-based models to, to explore that, what would that mean for uh, these kind of climate uh, integrated models. So I will say a little bit more about the, the human component. So you, some of you may think that, well, economics has been addressed, so we already addressed the, the human component. Um, that, might be, uh, that might be true, but there are a lot of issues with, the, with, with the economics, and that's also within economics. Um, there has been a lot of discussion in economics about the, the kind of modeling they are doing, especially since the economic crisis 2008, there's been a lot of debate about um, the, uh, uh, the, the way economists represent uh, economic systems. So this is by um, uh, Nobel laureate in economics, uh, Paul Krugman, why uh, economists uh, get so wrong. Um, also um, models, um, integrated assessment models by economists are criticized a lot um, so this is an interesting abstract. Um, what do the integrated uh, models tell us? Very little. And uh, if you go to more, they say, well, these models have crucial flaws that make them close to useless as tools for policy analysis. This is uh, published in one of the leading uh, journals in economics. So, uh, and, and may, 
So also within economics, the type of models they are using are, are criticized a lot, is recognized that there are a lot of challenges. So if we want to in, in, include social science, what do we include? So uh, there are a lot of other uh, uh, fields of social science. And last year, Jay mentioned that you had no idea that there were so many different disciplines in the social science. And, and uh, there are a lot of different social science. I, people ask with, when they, people see that I work in social science, they, oh, you're a sociologist. No, I'm not a sociologist. There are many different branches in social science. And they all do their own things. They have their own different theories, their own approaches. So uh, they have different types of, of uh, areas in economics and psychology, anthropology, sociology, uh, all kind of uh, other uh, fields like history and philosophy. And so, um, that, but most of them are not as much involved in using quantitative models. So that's, uh, that's one of the challenges. So, the, the economics is very uh, much more um, uh, focusing on and, and, and quantifying the, 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 the work using mathematical models. So another issue is that if people read about social sciences, they say, well, these are the results of these social science studies are quite obvious, which is true if you knew uh, the, the answer. Um, so, uh, Duncan Watts he wrote a very uh, nice book about this issue. Duncan Watts is a phys physicist who became a sociologist. Um, uh, people may know him from the Small World uh, uh, Network uh, research. So he did his PhD in, in, in uh, physics and became a sociology professor and now works for Microsoft. Um, and typically, this, because of a lot of the uh, uncertainties, a lot of the context related uh, phenomena in, in what social scientists are studying, which are expressed typically in narratives in qualitative data, they have not very precise predictions. And um, so there might be alternative explanations, but they are um, uh, kind of more, more kind of general statements than very precise predictions. So even if there are alternatives, uh, the, the if you are able to uh, identify what is the most logical um, explanation, that explanation sounds very obvious. So one of the examples that Duncan Watts uh, mentioned is, so why is the Mona Lisa painting the most famous painting in the world? Uh, well, that may be because it's uh, the, the quality of the painting uh, or it is uh, an accident. Uh, and um, I will, leave it up for you to, to read the book. What is the, of, of course, it, the answer is obvious, uh, but I will leave it up to you to, you to read what is the, the answer. So, um, so what are the challenges for, for the formula? So there are many different theories. Social scientists, they, they, they like to disagree with each other, or like to debate, and they are not have the culture to work together to develop this kind of more uh, general theory of the, the studies they, uh, uh, they do. They, tenures are often depending on writing a single audit um, uh, a book. Um, so it's less a culture of, of collaboration, um, uh, contesting and building up this, this, uh, this, this research uh, uh, and contesting each other's uh, uh, theories. A lot of the theories are qualitative, uh, expressed in narratives. And so that makes it hard to, to for Mollas to, to use. Basically, we have to interpret, we have to translate the narratives into um, uh, algorithmic expression. So that becomes a kind of subjective exercise. And um, a lot of the social science, they will argue that there's a lot of importance of the experience, you can only know something if you have experienced it and it's depending on the context, the interpretation, what's the meaning, and that becomes a, a very challenging in um, the, uh, expressing it in, in algorithmic statements and you may not have a model of uh, human systems that you develop that could be applied in all parts of around the world. So um, 
so what to do? Uh, so some um, uh, advice might be to take into account the diversity of the different theories uh, that you acknowledge that these, uh, there are a lot of, that you accept the subjective, that this is subjective enterprise and that you uh, focus on some specific questions. So I will now briefly show two examples to show the way we, we try to include these um, uh, social dynamics. So one is about hunting of uh, uh, by a chase. So this is working with anthropologists. So I worked with Kim Hill, who's an anthropologist, who worked for 30 years in the, in the Amazon, studying the hunter goddess, the hunt with them, et cetera. He had an enormous amount of data. And so when we started working on a model, he had hours, many hours of anecdotes, how they chased the armadillos. And, and so this is all fine, but it doesn't help me to develop a model. And uh, so I secretly developed a very simple random walk model and then showed it to him and said, so what needs to be, be added to make it more in line with, uh, th that we uh, lead to a better model. So the model had, uh, was in a fire, very high resolution for the kind of things that we are doing, 60,000 cells. And um, well, we created a a flow diagram of the decisions, which fits very much in line with optimal forcing theory. Um, the, uh, so it was kind of grounded in, 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 in theory, but then uh, uh, contextualized to the, the, the case of the Ache and, and Paraguay. I will not go much into to the details because of the time, but we had different levels of the model. Uh, so we started with with very simple random walk models, we, we included that they are in different camps, uh, which moves every day, and then they start moving through the forest uh, more in a coordinated fashion, and even if they are for some species hunt together, and we could increase in complexity, we could get better uh, performance. So, um, but I had to force the, uh, this process by providing a very simple version of the model so that uh, uh, my colleague could be more, uh, yeah, express uh, things that needs to be included that makes more sense. Uh, we could then use this model to, to, to look at what is the optimal group size and actually the optimal group size was very much in line with what was ob observed. Um, and uh, if we, we could also, uh, uh, so what, what the Ache actually uh, act in this uh, landscape, what would be uh, an, an optimal case. So one of the reasons that we do this kind of modeling of the hunter goddess that we are now developing a model in, uh, in South Africa about 100,000 years where we don't have direct observations, of course, and, um, and that will be a more complex environment. But we can test different uh, ways these um, uh, our ancestors have been moving around the landscape and interact with the landscape. And in the last few minutes, I would like to talk about urban water in Mexico City, which is a much more complicated situation on the goddess. Now we get into politics. That is very difficult to, to uh, put into some equations. Um, so a lot about flooding water scarcity. Uh, one reason why there is flooding is that Mexico City is built in a lake. Um, uh, so, uh, while well, the lake is not there anymore, but if it rains, it still end up in the center of Mexico City. Uh, and there are, uh, it's water scarcity because a lot of places don't have uh, piped water. And so there are major problems there. And so we have a large NSF project in which we try to integrate different components of, of the problem. We look at, we have some hydrological models, some local climate models, some urban growth models. And uh, me and a postdoc focus on uh, more the kind of policy environment. Um, that's the the uh, the agent based model where we uh, focus on the the, the interaction of uh, the water authority with the neighborhoods. So uh, the process here is that we have uh, the. The water authority, they have pr uh, the priorities, they have their mental models about what is important uh, for where to invest, where do we invest to prevent flooding to, or to invest in to reduce uh, water scarcity. 
and then these uh, decision trees affect the landscape in the different neighborhoods. There are 2,000 neighborhoods, and there are flooding events and uh, events related to uh, uh, water scarcity uh, that will have output impact of the neighborhood. Some neighborhoods may adapt, some neighborhoods may protest, and that will affect the, the, the actions of the water authority again. We exclude a lot of the elements that social scientists found important. We exclude all the informal economy. We don't include corruption. Um, and so if I talk, talk, talk about this to social scientists, they're all upset because I didn't include all the important elements. So we, we focus really on some very specific elements about the interaction of the water authority and the neighborhoods about what they invest in the infrastructure. And the infrastructure then interact with the biophysical system. Uh, so we are now have some initial version of the model uh, that, uh, uh, that we are starting to dis uh, discuss with stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders are the water authority, but also neighborhoods. And we are uh, uh, actually next week, we are doing some of the, um, uh, we start doing some of these validation uh, activities. We have some initial results about if we simulate this over the next 20 years, which areas do we expect will have more investment, which areas do we have more water scarcity. And this will be then used in an interactive way with, uh, with the uh, stakeholders. So to conclude, so a lot of social scientists qualitative and a lot of the theories are described as narratives. And so if you want to translate from these narratives to these algorithmic static statements, you have to, this requires some subjective interpretation. So uh, you make some points about predict, predictive models. Uh, we don't really like to talk about predictive models in the social sciences, that at least not for a lot of the things that we are doing. Uh, for some issues we can do. But, but typically we want to explore a lot of different possibilities, explore a lot of the assumptions on the underlying different theories. And if you want to work with, uh, with the social scientists, I think it's important to really put in time to understand also what the, the social scientists want to, uh, what is the importance of the social scientists um, to, uh, to represent in the models. What is the interest for the social science to be involved in the, in the projects that you are, are working on? Because they may have very different questions than uh, uh, we typically have. And that interaction may take years to really understand each other. Uh, at least that is my experience. And maybe I have one or two uh, questions that I can take. Okay, thank you. Um, that was great, thank you. So, um, a while ago, uh, after the Brexit farrago, um, there was a lot of criticism for the Bank of England. Is there anybody from Britain here? <laughs> Good, so if I get this wrong, don't hesitate to correct me, okay? And this is kind of subtle, I think. So the Bank of England came out with a lot of criticism for getting the model wrong. They sort of joined the cadre of these economists who are not able to model the future. And so there was an interview on the radio with uh, the, um, you know, the, the guy in charge, the Canadian, I can't remember his name now. And he said, um, the model was not wrong. It's just that when the Brexit happened, when, when the vote was to leave Europe and the UK economy was about to go down a tank, they had to, to um, invest a lot of money, a lot of new money basically into the economy. I mean, a lot, I can't remember how much. It was on the order of billions of pounds. Now that wasn't in the model because they're not allowed to, to think about what they might do if the outcome was of a, a particular direction. So that type of caveat, I guess you could call it, 
I, I don't know how you put that into a model when, when economists, particularly those who are highly regulated, like the chairman of the Bank of England, they themselves can't put those into the model. So how do you, how do, you do that? So I was involved in some of the IPC scenario exercises and also there we got scenarios that we were told not to, to, um, to, to use in a way. We got some results that were not acceptable, like uh, that some parts of the world will really go down in some of the scenarios. So uh, yes, there is a lot of politics involved in that way in, in some of these uh, social science uh, applications. Um, so I don't know about this case in, in, in the UK, but I know a lot of these economic models are, when they are used in practice, they are not literally using the models. It's a lot of the, uh, the qualitative understanding of the system too when they are giving advice. So, um, so that, that has always been the case since they start using um, econometric models. Um, so that's, so it's, it, in the social science very common as well, yes, you have a model, but don't rely too much on it. Uh, there's a lot of qualitative understanding that we are not including. But then that is not always known beyond, in a way, those those fields how this how these models are used. Yeah, uh, I'm Lawrence Bouja. I'm at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. I run a group that interfaces between social and physical sciences, and this isn't a question so much as a challenge for next year's program to have the same talk given by a social science. Um, because what I've found, I'm, I'm not a social scientist. You spent a lot of time telling us that you aren't one either. And what I found working with social scientists is that their theoretical base is just as deep as on the physics side. And as an interface group, I, 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 I'm always asking the social scientists, give me frameworks that let us work on this boundary that are so simple that even a physicist can understand them. So I'd really love to hear this talk from a, a social sciences perspective next year. So whoever's doing the, uh, the program, please think about that. Thank you. Uh, last one. Hi, Stephanie Kane. I'm a cultural anthropologist. Um, and I'm wondering, it seems like complexity is the biggest obstacle in the modeling problem, and I'm I'm hoping to hear in the next few days if we can build flexibility into your models rather than complexity. So that, taking the Mexico City example, uh, let's say the water management is, the, the head guy is a corrupt guy. And he's saying, I'm not giving water to these four neighborhoods or these 25 neighborhoods. Um, that could be modeled in if you had access to that kind of information. Is it possible to build models such that once you get some information from on the ground and you know what is the most relevant thing that you can factor it in, rather than just sort of give it up and say, oh my God, this is social science is too complex. Um, and then picking an arbitrary, which then gets called subjective, uh, parameter to include. Well, I don't think I disagree with uh, that arbitrary is the same as subjective, but um, so if we will know what the, the, the consequences, if we had the idea of oh, this is what the consequence will be of this corruption, yes, of course we can in include it, but we are trying to include the decision making of these water authorities for the next 20, 50 years. So we cannot rely on on what we observe today by some individuals. So that's why we have to model some processes. And we purposely try to keep it as simple as possible to, to make it, to keep it transparent. So it's not a predictive model at all, uh, but we can use it with the uh, different stakeholders so that they get an idea of what will be the consequence if you are um, combining these different simple rules of the neighborhoods of the water authorities and the biophysical system together. That is something that, uh, that people had not uh, uh, a good overview it. If you combine them together and what will be the long-term effect. But yes, we purposely keep it as simple as possible 
so that it is transparent. And uh, so that's maybe my mathematic background that we try to keep it as simple, but it's not aimed as a predictive model. And I think you, there are, for you, you, the modeling is only one of the different elements you use in this process. So that's, that's I think also we should not over, uh, fo maybe focus too much on the modeling in some of the, our applications. Well, this is about modeling, so I was trying to jump into that, but I, I think what you're doing is you're picking an arbitrary scale into the future and then, and then making things simpler in the present. And that may or may not be relevant for the people that you're, you're, you're trying to work with. But I, I disagree with the word arbitrary. They are not arbitrary. Okay, might arbitrary be is the wrong but, word, but in yeah. a complex world, when you're choosing one or two or three things to put in the model, I would say as an ethnographer, mm -hmm. that I would want to talk to people who live there or talk to someone who knows about the people who live there and then decide what my choice is going to be. And so then my model has to be flexible enough to be, be able to incorporate some of these things that I might not have sort of honed in on before. But this is a, like a three-day.